Greetings. This is Doc Ock coming at you live and direct from Black Facts Headquarters Central today in Kent, Ohio, doing it the same old way, hopefully a little better than I did before. Who and almost as good as I will be doing it forevermore. Now, let's see, what do we got today? We're still on people moving across the land, adventurers moving out and about, out of their comfort zone. And so today, we want to um, move into an area of study that gets short shrift, and that is the area of North Africa. Now, one of my pet peeves, you might call it, is that whenever I look at a book for children in particular, even adults, on Africa, for some reason, North Africa gets cut out of the picture. I mean, the whole is a huge swath all the way across North Africa. And all the authors want to talk about is sub Saharan Africa, as if that's some kind of Maginot line or demarcation or as if that wasn't just like a lake, a river, a swamp that the Native Americans used to cross, like the Native Americans used to cross the uh, the Black Swamp over here in Ohio. And so um, we're going to back up and we're going to talk about General Hamilcar Barca from Carthage. But before we do that, let's go ahead and do what we need to do, because this is Doc Ock at noon and nine. And you know, I got to do a few things every time you come on this live stream of mine, including present the proverb. So let's do the proverb for the day. And the proverb for the day is a blade can't cut a blade. A blade can't cut a blade. That's a Jamaican proverb. Uh, moving from there, moving on. We're going to do our little poem today. This is an original by yours truly. And it's called A Western Quest. Crusaders were the thing in 1096. The knights and the church were all up in the mix. 1519 marked the beginning of the end Life after that would never be the same. Genocide is his game. Santiago de Matamoros was his name. The one to whom all Spaniards prayed that the Moors would go. In the new world, they held on to some old ideas. So all the Criollos prayed to Santiago de Indios, the Indian killer. When the conquistadors left home, they had one thing on their minds, that whatever they would find would be claimed in the name of their lords and masters, the kings and queens of earthly domains. They were not on a spiritual quest. They went west seeking plunder and booty. That was their duty. Bring home the gold. That's the main thing they were told. When they only found a little, massacres ensued. Millions died, men, women, and children disemboweled. The streets ran red with their blood as they tripped and fell over their own entrails. This is the legacy of the Spanish conquest. No wonder they're so worried about Montezuma's revenge. Wouldn't you be? So that one there, it touches on two continents, on the continent of Eurasia, as well as the continent of the Americas, on North America in particular, but as well as South America. Because Santiago de Matamoros, that means St. Saint, Saint James, the Black Killer. But in the Americas, they changed his name to Santiago, the Indian Killer. But they still got a Santiago, they still got a Matamoros, uh, Mexico, just below the border, South of Texas. So if you're living over there in Texas and you hear about the um, the people being in the uh, detention camps, the concentration camps down there around Matamoros, that's the place they're talking about. It's the place called, the, the name of that place is Black Killer. 
and they when they say it, they mean it. They're not jiving. This is a historical thing. So uh, all of that came. It, that whole conflict goes all the way black, black, way black into history, at least as early as, if, if not earlier, than the conflict with Carthage and Rome. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today with the story of General Hamilcar Barca, the father of Hannibal. And it comes right out of this book right here, Profiles in African Heritage, which is a book that uh, one of my professors wrote by the name of Edward L. Jones out of uh, Seattle, Washington. And so this is all about what I say, Profiles in African Heritage, but it's all about... Um, a number of people that we that have been whitewashed. There's been a real attempt to whitewash these people and make it appear as though they're not Africans. So instead of saying they're from Africa, you'll hear them talk about they're from the Mediterranean, the Middle East, or the Barbary Coast. Where exactly is the Barbary Coast and where are the barbarians and who are the barbarians? Those are questions we're not going to be able to get into all today. But maybe this will give you a little bit of a clue. And certainly when we go into part two, which will be about uh, Hamilcar Barca's son, Hannibal. Yeah, that'll give you a real clue. All right. So here we go. Hamilcar Barca. This is a commentary on Hamilcar Barca. He belonged to the Barcine faction, which was the most powerful family in Carthage and had the respect of the army and the people. The Barca's family was originally from Libya, otherwise known as Africa. And Hamilcar was a Libyan. During the time that Hamilcar was suppressing the African uprising called the Mercenary War, a young African prince, Naravas, or Naravas offered his Numidian forces to Hamilcar. Hamilcar accepted and in turn promised his daughter to the young prince if he remained loyal to the Carthaginian cause. Um, oh, these two African leaders prosecuted the war together. It must be understood that the mercenaries were mostly Africans as well, otherwise known as Libyans. Libya was a name that was used to describe the continent of Africa at one point. So we're using those words interchangeably. Who had been exploited by the Carthaginian government through heavy taxes and other harsh measures. The leaders of the mercenaries were two Africans, Mathos and Spendius. They represented the people of Libya, while Hamilcar and Naravas, who were also Africans or Libyans, represented the aristocracy of Carthage. Could this three-year war be called a revolutionary uprising against the government of Carthage um, by the Libyans and Numidians who came under that government's jurisdiction? Many historians believe that such was the case. However, the most important fact to be remembered is that these men were black Africans, not of the Semitic, which means anything except black race, as William O'Connor Morris said in his book, Hannibal, on page 79, Hamilcar hated Rome with true Semitic hate. He had long wished to strike at her power with effect, but he was cautious and knew how to conceal his purpose. End quote. If the concept Semitic is not qualified, modified, or defined in context, the reader would more often be inclined to interpret it as meaning Jewish or relating to the Jews. Morris, Morris's statement racially transforms Hamilcar into a Jew. Another example of the subtle racial transformation of Hamilcar may be found in Salambo by Gustav Flaubert and translated by J.S. Chart uh, in 1931. Flaubert lists and describes the many races which comprise the mercenary army that is allowed to banquet of all places in the gardens of Hamilcar. They were Gauls, Ligurians, Numidians, 
Lusitanians, uh, Libyans, Valerians, quote unquote Negroes, and fugitives from Rome. Now he emphasized the word Negroes there, put that in italics. How about the term Negroes being applied to a novel based on ancient history? This can be very misleading to the average reader because he might be led to believe that Hamilcar and his daughter Mathos, Spinius, and Nar Nar uh, Narvas were all Caucasians, white, French, or English, etc., instead of the black Africans that they were. A similar racial transformation of Hamilcar and others occurred in a movie based on the novel, The Loves of Salambo, 1962, that starred Jacques Servas and Edmund Perdome. Hamil or Jacques Servas and Edmund Perdome. Hamilcar was portrayed as white, and so were all of the African leaders. The novel, as well as its criticism by Saint Beauvais, I don't know how to say it's French, is very revealing of the author's attempt to whitewash the greatness of the African leader, Hamilcar. So, as I was saying earlier, General Hamilcar Barkas, he lived uh, from approximately 271 to 229 BCE, before the Christian era. Quote, in individual courage, indeed, the Romans were far superior, but the general to whom the palm must be given both for daring and for genius is Hamilcar, called Barcus, the actual father of the Annabal, who afterwards made war on the Romans, end quote. The first Punic War was between two world powers, two world powers, Rome and Carthage. They're, no, they're known as city-states. The prize to the winner would be the undisputed right to rule the world. Carthage had always controlled the seas and her great navy, or excuse me, with her great navy and through her land forces. She had subjugated other cities and countries such as Sicily, Sardinia, and Libya. The Romans were jealous of the Carthaginians because they were great merchants or imperialists. These merchants would seize control of the trade of their colonies and use the resources for the benefit of the Carthaginian nobles. Since Sicily was considered the gateway to Italy, the Romans decided to challenge Carthage's sovereignty over the area by sending in its army. This was the beginning of the First Punic War, approximately 264 BCE. The Romans and the Carthaginians fought on land and sea for 18 years. They were both of equal strength, with Carthage having an advantage through its control of the seas. And we're going to come back to that theme later about the, this control of the seas piece. The Carthaginian Senate, hoping to bring the war to a successful appointed Hamilcar Barcus to command the land and naval operations in 247 BCE. It could be said that General Hamilcar Barcus, as head of one of the leading families of Carthage, might well be compared to a present Rockefeller or a Kennedy as a person whose family helped to rule Carthage. The exception to this comparison, of course, is that the Rockefeller and Kennedy families are not as families in control of the government. In Carthage, the government was an oligarchy and was run by a few leading families of which Hamilcar's was one. When Hamilcar took command of the mercenaries, he demonstrated what a great military leader and strategist he was by immediately seizing the initiative. He ordered his navy to ravage the Italian coast. After completely destroying several coastal cities, he established a beachhead at a place called Hercta. Now it's called Monte Pellegrino. Lying near the sea, 
between Eryx and Panor Panormus. Panormus. The area had many advantages for the protection of the army. It was an excellent hill for observation. It commanded a harbor that was accessible for ships to put in. The water supply was abundant. The hill only had three approaches, all difficult, two on the land side and one from the sea. Hamilcar set up his command post on Herkta and without any support from the citizens of the surrounding towns, he literally threw himself and his army into the midst of the enemy. The general kept the Romans in a state of peril by pressing the attack and forcing them to fight at inopportune times. The Romans, led by Junius, took up positions not far from the Carthaginians at Eryx on its summit. The daily assault of these two generals were numerous. There were ambushes and counter ambushes. It appeared that the forces on each side were evenly matched and each general displayed equal strength, skill, and courage. Although there were daily conflicts, neither side could claim a decisive victory. Approximately three years later, the nature of the conflict changed. The struggle grew more desperate. Amilcar, a genius at strategy, made a significant move with his forces. He seized the town, which lies between Eryx, where the Romans were garrisoned on its summit and, it, and, and its base. This move placed the Romans in a perilous situation of being besieged. The Carthaginians maintained their positions, though the enemy was attacking from all sides. Amilcar launched attacks along the supply routes of the Romans, and this slowed down the flow of supplies. The Romans became desperate after two years of struggle because Amilcar had prevented them from fulfilling their original plans of winning the war with their land forces alone. Morris, in his description of the genius of Amilcar at Mount Erkta, said that his position continued to improve with time and would have been successful if it had not been for the lack of support from Carthage. His army had begun to hem the Romans in and to lessen their hold in all parts of Sicily. He seems to have contemplated a descent on Italy. This, however, required a large addition to his fleet. And the weak, short-sighted Carthaginian government not only refused to supply this, but reduced by degrees his available naval force and left him isolated, almost isolated in his camp. The Roman Senate agreed to make a third attempt to win the war with the use of its navy at sea. They thought that by striking a deadly blow at sea, the tides of war would turn in their favor. The Romans' decision to try for a victory at sea was caused primarily by the bold and courageous fighting of Amilcar, the great Carthaginian general. The Romans actually dreaded the Carthaginian land forces and the bravery of General Amilcar. Rome once more made one of those marvelous efforts in which no nation has ever been her equal. The Roman Senate, citizen, or Senate backed by its citizens, built another great fleet and dispatched it to Sicily. This fleet was composed of 200 quinquiremes, fully equipped. Suddenly, uh, they suddenly appeared off the coast of Sicily and seized the harbors of Drapana and Lilibaeum. The Carthaginians were taken by surprise because they did not believe that the Romans would again contest their supremacy of the seas. Carthage sent sea, uh, ships loaded with supplies for Amalcar's troops in Sicily, but they were not ready for battle at sea. The Romans intercepted the Carthaginian fleet and nearly destroyed it. Carthage was no longer able to send supplies to Amalcar's land forces because the enemy now controlled the seas. The general recognized that all was lost and that he had no reasonable prospects of achieving victory without his navy. Nothing could save Sicily from becoming a part of the Roman Empire. And we're going to end right there today. 
So um, that is, those are some of the exploits of Amokar Barka, the uh, father of Hannibal. So based on how much I read there today, I can see that I won't be able to get very much done on Hannibal tomorrow. So what I'm going to do is I'll change up the schedule just slightly here and I'll continue reading about Hamilcar tomorrow and hopefully we'll be able to finish off that piece on Hamilcar Barkas because that's an, an important precursor to that first Punic War to the war that Hannibal fought, which is known as the second Punic War. So these wars continued. Um, they went from one war to another war. And we may have to do that one. Uh, we may, may not get to Hannibal until Monday, but we will get to Hannibal and we will uh, go through his history, et cetera. In the meanwhile, I need y'all. I'm hoping I'm leaving everybody out there with a great big smile as we do it in style. Um, please don't forget, if you're on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and subscribe below. Those are two things you can do to support us without having to give us any dough. The second thing I'd like to mention is for all you on Facebook, you got a donation button right there below. So you can donate quite easily. Just go below, make your donation there. If you're on YouTube, you can go to our website, donate over there on the donation page. We need, we always need more funds and you see what we use them for. We use them in order to stock our archive with, images, the images that we use on our live streams, as well as the uh, books that we get our information from. And right now we have thousands of books, but that doesn't mean we don't need more because we're going deeper into various, a variety of subjects that we haven't gone this deep into before. So we can always use for more information. By the way, um, you know, we've got a theme every month, and this month the theme is African Adventurers. Next month, the theme is going to be all about the um, black power in a white university. We're going to do that for a whole month, and we'll be dealing with Dr. Crosby and the Black United Students and their whole history, etc. So, all that to say, Peace out without a doubt. I'll be black uh, ASAP. Nine o'clock tonight, 12 o'clock noon tomorrow. This is Doc Ock at noon and nine, signing out without a doubt.